All right, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Today, <clears throat> we learned uh, yesterday and the day before <clears throat> a little bit about the deeper meaning of the red cow and how it represents what's called Ratzavashov, going and coming back. We said the burning of the red cow is the aspect of fire going up, reducing it to ashes, and the water that is put on is coming back down, and that's the whole secret of life. And that's why the para aduma, one of the reasons why the red cow was the cure for the impurity of death. Because death is, like it says, it doesn't move, it's dead. And um, the whole thing of the para aduma is to move, move, action, being dynamic. So that's the idea of the red cow, that the red cow is the, the, uh, the ultimate purity. And it shows, indicates on ultimate movement and service of the creator of the universe, going closer and then realizing you have to come back into the world to fix up the world and then realizing, but the world is not, <clears throat> not enough truth revealed here. So you want the truth and you go up like fire and then you realize, but the purpose is to come back into the world. So it's going up and coming down all the time. That's the whole idea of the red cow. And that's why it says, Torah, because that's the whole essence of the Torah. The Torah is called the Torah of life to activate us that we should be devoted to the creator and everything that we do. Because the creator is like his name, he creates, he's creating everything. And we feel that purpose that the creator is creating the world for. And even if we don't feel it, but we believe that there is, and we believe that there is a creator and he's ultimately infinitely good. So we wanna be closer to him, at least to be a little more aware of him, that's going up. And then, we realize that we can't just do what we want. We have to do what the creator wants, be in this world, make the world a good place, use our talents, our abilities, our personality to be in the world. That's coming back down. So that's the, and that's the antidote to death. Death sort of paralyzes a person as far as God is concerned. He's indifferent to the creator of the universe. That's death. And I mean, a person can live his whole life, right? And he makes a lot of money and et cetera. And when he dies, so it's, he's essentially hasn't really accomplished anything eternal. He's done everything for himself and now himself is not there anymore. So that's death. So a person that every moment of his life, he can be dead. But if a person does things for Hashem or says things or thinks things for Hashem and he has the proper idea of what Hashem is, which if he does, it should make him excited about Hashem, then whatever he does or says or thinks has some connection to something eternal. It's much bigger than his self that dies. So that means something becomes eternal. That's the whole secret of the golden cap. It makes everything dynamic and eternal. Okay, now we're going to have another thing. This, this Torah portion is packed with action. It's packed with action. There's a couple of wars over here. And the Kanani, they fight with the Kanani. And then they're going to fight with the Amorim. And uh, Aaron dies. Miriam dies. Of course, it starts off with the red cow. Unusual. The most unusual commandment in the Torah. <clears throat> and uh, Moses strikes the rock. Uh, we talked about that. But here's, here's an interesting story that happens over there. This is after Aaron dies. So the Jewish people start, the Jewish people are always complaining. And then I, well, you can't really blame them for complaining. Because, uh, you know, they're, they're wandering around in the desert. And true, they're surrounded by clouds, but they, they're uncertain, total uncertainty. They never know really when they're going to, what tomorrow is going to bring. They're just, and now they're supposed to go into the land of Israel and, and they don't exactly go in right immediately. And they're, and they're always dependent on this bread falling from heaven. And the bread is like, looks the same every day. So the Jewish people, they start complaining. And when they start complaining, 
So it says God sends these snakes. And let me read it to you from the Bible. It says like this. <clears throat> it says like this. Um, the Jewish people went from the mountain where Aaron died. And Tiksan Anefesh Ambaderach, and the people they got impatient. They patient. They said, Hey, we're coming near the land of Israel. Why uh, why why don't we just go in? <clears throat> and the people started speaking against God and against Moshe. They said, Why did you take us out of Egypt in order to die in the dead the dead bar? In the in the in the desert, in the midbar. There's no bread. We haven't got bread. We haven't got any water. We hate this light bread. It says that they went to the, they did, they ate, and they didn't go to the bathroom. And so they were worried, you know, you, you don't go to the bathroom for like 40 years, you start to worry a little bit, you understand? So, I mean, so these people had a good reason to worry. Nevertheless, they did, and they complained against Moses. They didn't realize up to this point that everything that was happening, it would turn out okay. So they complained. What did God do? God sent the people these snakes these poisonous burning serpents. And they, whenever anybody got bit, they died. So here we have another encounter with death. So he said all the, the people died and the people came to Moses and said, okay, we did a sin. We spoke against you. Just get rid of these snakes. <clears throat> and um, so Moshe prayed to the people. Moshe prayed for the people. And God sent, said to Moses, Moses, Make yourself a snake and put it on a pole. And anyone that gets bit will look at the snake and he will die and he will live. There's a, some opinions that say that anybody got bit actually did. He would look at the snake and he would die and then he would come back to life. In any case, the snake on the pole, uh, uh, it negated death, right? So Moses made this snake and he made it from copper, the and he put it on a, <clears throat> some places written bronze, but that's not right. That's not a proper translation. Nehoshet is, is, is uh, copper. Anyway, okay, so he put it on this pole, and anyone who got bitten by the snake would look at it, and he would live. That's it. That's the end of the story. So now the Rebbe asks an obvious question. What in the world did he have to make a snake and put it on the... So it says in the Gomorrah that it was not because they looked at the snake. Come on, a snake doesn't have people. Because they looked up at God. They looked up in others, the sky. The earth, you figure a person can make the earth. Who knows, you know. But sky, you can't make the sky. What are the sky? So the people looked up at the sky and they realized, wow, there's a creator of the heavens. And they so in other they raised their eyes up to the heavens. And that's what saved them. A snake doesn't stay there. So you ask the question, so why make a snake? You know, make a, 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 a pole with an arrow on it, right? Or tell everybody, look up and you'll live. Look up at God and you'll live. And no doubt about it, if a person was dying from a snake, you just tell them, okay, the cure is look up in the sky and you'll die. And you'll live. <clears throat> look up in the sky, you won't die. So who's not going to look up in the sky? Everyone's going to look up in the sky. What do you have to make a snake for? What do you have to make a snake? A bronze snake, and he puts it on a pole, and everybody looks up, right? What are you going to tell a person? He gets bitten by a snake. He's dying. Say, look up. Eh, I don't want to look. Which direction is up? Eh, I'm not going to look. So he says, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll make a snake with copper. Then people will look up. You make, oh, a copper snake. I get it now, Moses. You want me to look up? Come on, that's ridiculous. Of course, everybody would look up. What do you have to put a snake on a pole for? A snake on a pole? What for? So that's the question the Rebbe's going to answer. And the answer is amazing. Incredible answer. And it's an amazing deep lesson for us in our day-to-day -day life. Good morning. Shalom. Amazing lesson. Let's see if we can get to it. Ready? Here we go. Moses made a copper snake for Yassimi while Nais, and he put it on a pole. And he lifted it up. If a snake bit anybody, he beat all the nachash. He would look at this nachash and nachoshes at this copper snake, and he would live. It says in the Mishnah in Rosh Hashanah, "Al 
Alzeh. She Yisrael about this. The Yisrael would look at the, they would raise their heads up heavenward. And they would connect their <clears throat> hearts to their Father in heaven. And that would heal them. If so, ask the question, Kasha, we got a question. If so, why do you need a snake? You could just tell everybody, look up. It says it should be that if anybody got bit by the snake, they would just look up at the, at the heavens. Right? Moses just tells everybody, look up at the heavens and you'll be saved. Everyone look up. But, oh, it also, my stock was clapping my lip. What does it mean that they have to look up at God? At God. God? God's in the heavens, right? He says, what are you talking about? Of course he's in the heavens. But it's explained in a lot of places in prayer. of Lamata, that your eyes are supposed to be down and your heart is supposed to be up. Your heart is supposed to be, your eyes are supposed to be down to look at the world. You want somebody to get healed. Right, so you look at the person and say, "God, please heal my uncle. Please heal my next door neighbor." <clears throat> it's a very common thing, right? You put your head down in prayer. Your eyes are supposed to be down, but your heart is supposed to be up. So, what are you putting a copper snake that people lift their eyes up? Well, having to understand this, Nachman, let's first of all understand why the soul comes into the body. We, we, let's put this thing in proper perspective. Why is the soul in the body? The main reason that the soul is in the body is to cling to our creator, our master God, with love and fear. The Iker Devekot and the main clinging to God is filled with prayer. Shat is that the words of prayer, him yoter krovim. The words of the prayer, they are understandable. Certainly before the soul. Okay, so that's the purpose, right? A person looks at the words, and it, words you can understand, right? <clears throat> you look at a, you look at your, the, the at the grocery list your wife makes, and you see it says, you know. The, Two bottles of milk, two bottles of can cartons of milk, and this you see you read a word, and the word has a meaning. So if you look at the words and you see words have meaning, and it says God creates the, the heavens, God creates the earth. Oh, so you start to understand, right? So the words direct you to think about God. The more you start thinking about God, that God creates me, and God is really good, and God really creates the whole world, and God is He provides for us, and God. So you start to like God, and then you realize, well, God is creating me. That's that's awesome. And you have fear of God. You don't want to do the wrong thing. That's why the soul comes into the body in order to get excited about God. It says the Rebbe, it makes no sense. But I certainly, that's the whole reason, just to have love and fear of God. But I certainly, certainly when the soul <clears throat> was in heaven before it came into the world, the Gam Achar and after a person dies, leaves the body. He certainly is connected more. He certainly is more aware of the creator. The Nemius. <clears throat> His love and fear is more real. And how do you say? Uh, the, 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 the consuming. <clears throat> before he's put into the body and after he leaves the body. Because your body doesn't let you serve God. Right? You want to pray to God, think about God, all of a sudden the phone rings, or somebody's at your door, suddenly you're hungry, suddenly you're tired. <clears throat> <clears throat> suddenly you remember you had to do something. <laughs> because of Chomro, because of the physicality of the body, it forces the soul from, the, from physical things. So what, what's going on? If the purpose is to be in this world and to have love and fear of God, to have love and fear of God, so love and fear is the point. The soul had love and fear before and it was in the body and it'll have more after. It's more aware of, of God. Now here we're going on the supposition that there's such a thing as a soul. According to Judaism, there's a soul and the soul is eternal. The soul is eternal. The soul never dies. I, I, I don't know, even know according to Judaism. According to, 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 to fact, there's a soul. I mean, you don't have to believe it if you don't want to. But, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to believe that just sort of 
you know, your parents have relations and all of a sudden there just, you know, pops out this thing that thinks and talks and has ideas and inspiration and love and fear. It's just sort of, you know, part of the kit. You know, there comes, okay, you can believe that, you know, but <clears throat> there's a soul inside of a person. There's a soul. Why is it so bad to kill a person, right? Because you separate the soul from the body. The soul is a precious thing. It's not, a, it's not a, any sin to chop wood. Chopping wood is no sin, right? So you chop a person up. What's the difference between chopping a soul? Because the soul is something valuable. Okay, so the, I'm sorry, sure that there's people who say that there is no such thing as a soul. A lot of people, and killing a person is just because you, they, I don't want them to kill me or there won't be any order in society. Any, whatever reason is, the fact is there is a soul. And this soul exists, and the soul is you. And the soul is your consciousness. And all the things that when you put into the body, so the body adds all these... Uh, you want to call it the connections and diversions that you didn't know you had. You didn't know you think you had. <clears throat> right? Uh, maybe I can give you the simple. I, I give this example all the time, but there's these people that win the lottery. So before they win the lottery, the lottery, and they win like $50 million, right? 50 million. So before they won the lottery, they were okay. They had a normal life. They loved their parents, their parents, they loved their children, they loved their wife, they had a, a job, they had friends. All of a sudden it gets $50 million. A whole new thing enters into his life. The fifty million dollars, if he's not lucky, and I mean he can, but the fifty million dollars suddenly it controls him. Now he's rich. Now he has to deal with this. He's suspecting everybody. He's worried. He's afraid. Where should I hide the money? Right? He doesn't. His, his children. All of a sudden, they're not his children anymore. His wife. His others. Is he? He's, he has all. He wants to have pleasure. He wants to. What am I down here? I'm going to go on and live it up. I'm. Gonna, who knows what? The money drives him crazy. Well, the same thing, the soul, it gets put into the body. The body drives us crazy. The body has this tendency to get attached to all sorts of <clears throat> meaningless things and overreact and overconnect and over this. So, so best thing is, if you wouldn't have won the money, they wouldn't have won the, or they would have given them a little bit of the time or something like that. It, it, it would have been better for him if you wouldn't have won. Then he would have been a normal person. With it. But same thing with the body, with the, with the soul. Better that, that you shouldn't put the soul into the body. The body just completely makes the person go crazy, right? He forgets about God. He forgets about that he's a creation. He forgets the, the, what real love is, what real values are. He forgets until it gets put into the, right? <clears throat> says, if so, why does God do such a thing? Even though the soul says when it's in heaven, it doesn't want to come into the world. Because the source of the soul is a portion of God from above. And it wants to cling to the Creator even more. This is especially talking about Jewish souls, what's called the godly soul. But it's true about the animal soul also, the natural soul. Behold, Mabur, it's explained in the Zohar, one who does not transform bitterness to sweetness. A person that comes into this world and it doesn't transform the bitterness of this world into sweetness, then it doesn't really get heaven. He gets some sort of reward, whatever, but that's not the real thing. This is the whole essence of a person. What? To be in the world and to transform it. When the, there's no, it's no accomplishment to have love and fear of God and be aware of God, when the soul is up in heaven, that's all there is. And the same thing after a person dies, that's all it is. But to have love and appreciation of God, when a person is in this world, ooh, that's a new thing. And especially to transform the darkness, the difficulties, and the disturbances and challenges of this world, and to think about God, even you know, when a person is in Auschwitz or whatever, or a person all of a sudden he has big desires for something, and he thinks, no, I'm not going to do it because God doesn't want me to. I'm, 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 I'm going to do what my Creator wants me to. Oh, this is a big novelty. This is a big novelty. You can't see the Creator yet. He's got hit over, hid the creator. He hid himself and for a person to serve God. In this situation, oh, this is a, it's a thing that, so to speak, God himself couldn't do. God can't be, hide himself from himself. This is the whole essence of man. That's the reason people were created. To overcome and to transform these challenges. Shari, the Bayad, Rishon in the first temple. It says they didn't even have to pray. They didn't pray. They went to the Holy Temple. People were aware of God. Also in the second temple, 
the men of the great assembly, they established <clears throat> what was called the short prayer. Obavada, I certainly call of Urashalayim, Loaya, Kiim, Alder, Zel, Afokmir, And certainly their service was the service of the soul to, to transform darkness to light. But it was a little bit easier then. Now it's become more and more progressively darker and darker and darker. So we have more and more challenges. And it should be that the reward, I guess, is greater, you know, because the challenges are greater. That's what we're going to see. But Inyan, who, ki, hadinim, nimtakim b'shoshom. Says, how, <clears throat> this whole world, right? God is revealed in the upper world, so God is revealed. There it's pure good. Pure good. Just good giving, right? God just gives the soul, creates the soul from nothing. Gives it life all the time. Gives it re revelation. That's that's what God does. That's what the Bible says. You know, why does God do such a thing? That's what God does. He creates, creates. He creates, he creates souls. When the soul is up in heaven, so it feels it's being created. It's just so grateful, right? All the time, just tremendously grateful. <clears throat> when the soul comes down into the world, so it's, it's concealed. All this gratitude and what we have to be grateful for. God is the source of life. God is the source of all being. God is the source of meaning. God is the source of, 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 of uh, health and, and happiness and wealth and love. And this, God is the source of all that we get in the world. We forget about this. We forget about this. People look around for love. Where can I find love? Where can I find meaning? Where can I find this? So it says for a person to find this in this physical world, this is a big, amazing thing. But the problem is, is that God, he's the one creating the world. He's the one making all the troubles. God is the one making all the troubles. And God wants us to overcome these troubles. He says, how do we, do, do we fix it up? You have to go back to the source. So what does it mean? Why is God making all these troubles? Why did these things happen? Why? It must be for some sort of a good reason. God is good. When we get to the source of why everything was created, and why is this happening to me? Huh? Why is everybody always picking on me? Why is it happening to me? All of a sudden you realize, listen, it's not this person is doing something to me. This is God himself is sending this person to cut me off on the, on the road or to try to cheat me or to this. And now how should I react according to what it says in the Torah? It's a challenge. According to what it says in the Torah, and according to the Torah, you're not supposed to get angry. You're not allowed to get angry. So you get angry, it's like worshiping an idol. To have lust, he runs after money, you lust, lust, right? But these things, God made them. The, 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 the luring. And he made me in such a way that I, I'm lit up by these things. Right? Why did God do it? He did it so that I would challenge it. So in other words, you go back to the source. This is in a dinim, all these concealments and severities of God can only be fixed in their source. Hine, call raos, all the bad things. The dinim... And all of the, how do you say, the, 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 the severities and harshness of this world. God forbid, Rahman Natslan, God should save us. Shinishavu Ba'olam, that are come from the world. Shoshim Mamakoram, Hamachayo Sam Muto. God is making it all, right? God is making it all. I mean, even to the, to the ridiculous point where you have to say, yes, Auschwitz was somehow good. <laughs> okay. How can a person say a thing like that? It's the worst thing that could possibly be. He says, you're right, 100%. All the pains that the Jews have had through all the years and all of this, somehow or in some totally incomprehensible way, it is good. And we have absolutely no idea how it's good, but faith tells us that it's good. Now, this is totally opposite of human nature, and that's the whole point, to go against your nature. When something bad happens, right? I'm driving down the street, and somebody cuts me off, right? Cuts me off, road rage. Automatic, right? It just flames up inside him. We're supposed to think, no, God wanted this to happen so that it would, okay, it, 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 if you're a type of person that has a bad temper, so this is a real battle. This is a real battle. It's much more difficult to overcome yourself than it is to overcome this guy who just cut you off, right? Let's say you cut him off and you stop him and you run to his car and you punch him and you knock him down and there's a big fight, but you win. Huh? That's not easy. Not easy to do. Much more difficult to defeat your own self, defeat your own anger. How can you do that? So you have to go to the source. This is really happening. God is making this happen. This is the guy did not cut me off. 
God wanted him to cut me off for some sort of a reason. What's the reason? I don't understand it. But for some people not to get mad when you get cut off, would be, it, those same people, it could be that they would be able to withstand the tortures of Auschwitz. They would be able to find a way. But a person that has a bad temper, that's the, that's the thing that knocks. That's exactly the, what happens. The wrong thing happens exactly to the wrong people, person. So he says, <clears throat> how, do you, how does a person do it? So he says, well, one way is you get it to the source. The source of everything is good. Kamashala zona, like the example of the prostitute in Ben Melech with the son of the king. What's the son of the king and the prostitute? What is it? In the Zohar, she called Ratzona that all she wants, the Chetza, Shalol, the Tzayat, Lauta, not to listen to her. Obeze, Titane, Gyoter, this she'll get even more pleasure. She tehe, Ahuva, Lamelech, because she loves the king. <clears throat> okay, what's the story over there with the king? With the king? Once upon a time, there was a king, and the king had a son, and he knew his son one day was going to be his successor, take over. So the king wanted to know if his son was a genuine king. The king himself was a genuine king. And now what is a king? A king, all he thinks about is his people. The king, all he thinks about is the people, his, his, his nation. And if he's really even a good, better king, he thinks about the benefit of the whole entire world. But first of all, his people. That's what he's thinking about, right? A king can't go running after ladies. He can't go right, going around taking drugs, they, like, they're, they're living for his own pleasure. Even for one moment, he can't do it. What's the, what's the reason? Very simple reason. If he, goes, if he goes running after drugs, left to women, he can be compromised, right? Some lady can come and that was the whole story. They had Matahari. That they, they said, anyway, who knows if it was true, but they, they send a lady and she entices someone and she gets secrets. All of a sudden he gets secrets from him, right? Do you like me? Yes, you'll tell me where the atom bomb is hidden. No, I can't do that. Are you sure, my dear? Okay, I'll tell you. Right, so, uh, so, that, so he, it has to be, so what is, how does the king know? How does the king know if his son is going to be faithful or not? Is going to be, is it, so what's he made of? So the king finds a prostitute, gets a, pays a lady, and she's exactly the, 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 exactly what will arouse his son's lust, right? His son's lust. Some people like, you know, blonde hair, this, that. He found exactly what his son wants, and he pays, pays her. And he says, if you, entice my son to sin with you, I'll give you a million dollars. So she, and you have to do a really good job. So she thinks to herself, your majesty, what, what would you want me to do a thing like this? I mean, you know, so I want to see what my son is made of. So you really have to do a good job. Really have to do a good job. That's the whole point. Some, according to some opinions, it says that she, she finds another prostitute so that she won't, won't give him any hints. In any case, the original prostitute, that's her job, is to entice the son. So what does she do? Let's say she gets another prostitute. But the first prostitute, she inside, she's also loyal to her country. She hopes with all of her being that the, that the prince will not listen to, he will not be enticed. That he will act like a king, he'll keep his royalty, and he won't act like an animal. That's what she really hopes. But on, one, on the other hand, she has to do her best to really test him. So it says that's the whole point. God puts us into this world. This is the example brought in the Zohar. God puts us in the world, and he purposely puts us in the world and brings us things that exactly that makes us angry. Exactly that makes me depressed. Exactly that makes me lustful. Exactly that makes me, right? It gives me all sorts of, of confusion. Exactly that. And God puts us in the world, exactly puts all these prostitutes in front of us so that we will, they say, prostitute yourself that will lower ourselves down. We'll give in to our animal instincts. <clears throat> but the, it says that the evil impulse itself doesn't really want the, the prostitute in this case. The evil impulse, our own natural impulses, do not want us really that we should follow them. That we, They want that we should defy them. Masha Enkin, which is not the case. Kishim <clears throat> Fate If this prostitute succeeds in luring the prince. So on one hand, she's happy she did a good job. I mean, she did a good job, but on the other hand, she's miserable because the king's son didn't stand the test. She knows that what happened, 
The king, in other words, has an external will that she should do her best to entice him. But on the other hand, his inner will of the king is that his son should not be fooled. And she has to do her best to fool him. And she and the king all hope that the son won't be fooled. And the son, deep down inside, he knows if someone would come to him and say, uh, tell your majesty, your prince, if someone sent you a beautiful prostitute and told you to, to uh, not you, you know, another prince of another country, should he go for, after the prostitute? The, the king's son would say, of course not. That's ridiculous. That would ruin his whole integrity. Of course he should. But when it happens to him, so now it's a big test. So it's the same thing as also in the world. Not, we know what to do. Intellectually, we can give other people advice, but all of a sudden it comes to us and the world puts us into depression and aggression and confusion and lust. And the, that's the whole reason why. And how can we all overcome this? The king's son, what does he have to do in order to overcome this? This lady is exactly what he's, he wants. It's just, it's, it makes him, lights him up like fire. What's he supposed to do? He's supposed to think, one second, I am a king. I have to think about the whole country. I can't do what I want. I am a king. That's my true identity. He has to totally always remember this. <clears throat> That's what it means, my result. The same thing with us. We have to think that we're in this world. One second. I am a Jew or I am a human being. God is creating me. God put me here that I should act like a person, not like an animal. But not like an animal. And if a person thinks that, then he's got a chance. That's what it says. That's what it says that Satan and Panima, it's two aspects of, of the Yetzirah, the devil. That they trick us and they drive, drive us crazy. Their real intention is for the sake of heaven. What does it mean? That we should withstand the test. Omru, it says, like it says, in another place it says that the devil, the devil, not that, the devil is a creation of God, right? But God gives him sort of like, sort of free reign. Maybe we'll talk about this another time. Look, open the book of Job. See the book of Job? Right in the middle, it says, God has this conversation with the devil. Book of Job, open it up. Is it? Omer, it says <clears throat> that the, the devil, not that in of the Mikdash Rishon, he put his eyes on the first temple, the Hriv one destroyed it. Mashmash, and it kind of both uh, seems to be that he, the, 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 the devil was jealous of it. Oh, the de what does it mean? I thought that the that we just finished saying that the devil and the, the, the power, evil powers of evil, they really want to do what God wants. They don't want us. They don't want us to sin. Here it says that he, he the, <clears throat> the first temple where nobody was sinning, they were doing the will of God. So the devil wanted to stop us. What's going on? And you know, like the Shashor Shara, the really source of all evil, which the source enlivens it, who told is good. Come aboard, like it says in the Zohar Sham, the key of the damar the mari the mari is can there be a servant that rebels against his master? Hagam sheish kama vadim mit partsim me edaroneim. Even though it's true there are sometimes servants that rebel. Avolheim basar vadam. This is physical uh, servants. The chayusim nifradim zemizeh, and they don't their life doesn't come from the king, right? If they go against the king, they're not pulling out the plug. Avol of the Hashem. But the angels, the, the devil, etc., that these are just creations of God, that they receive their life, but who machaya to call, he enlivens everything. How could there be power in the devil or in people even to go against God? And it answers the question, Zona. And that's what it gives the answer that this is like the prostitute. That in other words, the devil, our evil impulse is sent by God. And that's its job. Its job is to make us crazy. And this is what enlivens all of the evil in the world. But the source from above is good. In other words, all the bad things in the world are here as a challenge. I mean, I think personally that God really over overdid it. You know, I think there's too much of a challenge. But I mean, if I was God, I wouldn't have created the world and hope in the first place. So God did create the world, which I think is a good thing, you know, as, as far as I don't know. Anyway, he, he did it anyway. We can't, it's, it, it, and, he, and he is, the, God is the ultimate good. The, what this good is and why it's going to be will be revealed in the raising of the dead. That's what we believe. That's Jewish faith. 
The source of all the bad really is good. What does it mean? That God creates all the bad things so we should not be affected negatively by them. Okay, Lamata, when this good comes down in below, it becomes true bad. The dinim gemorim, and it becomes true severity, screaming out, there is no God, do what you want, get angry, have your lust, do it, etc. Hein b'mili the alma, hein b'mili the shemaya, whether it is spiritual makeup of these weird religions you got that you can make up, or you can make up the, 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 the governments that kill people, they murder. Hine kishibod, and when a person comes, God forbid, some sort of difficulties in life, Yachshav, you should think, don't look at things and take everything at face value. Don't think that it is evil. It looks like a vav is designed. Okay, maybe I need glasses. A person shouldn't think that things that happen that are bad are really bad. Totally bad. Ella Ba'emis, but really Shorshu, who told the source is good. Kimi Menu is Brech, Lot Tetze Aros, because from God doesn't come any bad. Kiim, Raktov, only good. Now, this does not mean that if you're sick, you should be happy, or if your next door neighbor dies, that you should rejoice, something like that, right? Your best. No, there are definitely bad things in the world. And if a person is sick, he should definitely try to heal himself. And it says in the days of the Mashiach, one of the purposes of Mashiach is that there won't be any more bad things in the world. You know, famine and war and destruction and death and disease and all these uh, psychological problems and, you know, of depression and things like that. These things are bad. There's no doubt about it that they're bad. But you should know that somehow or other the source is good. The source is good. When that source is revealed, then the bad goes away. So in other words, the, the things that are bad in the world, ideally, that's only to get rid of them, to ignore them, not to give them any life. There's, there's full stories, hundreds, maybe thousands of stories of people that went to the Lubavitcher Rebbe. They had problems. They got a blessing and the problem went away. I just read a story the other day for some fellow in South Africa. They had some rare eye disease and he was, you know, he was a young child and he was going blind. There was no way that you could get, you know, you could get out of this. All the doctors said he was going blind. And he went in front of the Rebbe and didn't even say anything. People were just filing by the Rebbe, receiving. The Rebbe would give a dollar to everybody that went by a dollar and to encourage them to give this dollar to charity or to change it and give another dollar to charity. Anyway, he went by the Rebbe. The Rebbe just, he didn't say anything to the Rebbe. And he went with his mother. And he said, your son will merit to see and to learn Torah or something. You have to look and see what it was. And right immediately afterwards, immediately afterwards, they sent to the doctors. He made these, uh, these checkups. And the doctor said there was no problem. They, they, they compared his, his previous reports with the some the Rebbe just got rid of the disease. I know, I know, I've heard hundreds of stories like that. And why, how could the Rebbe do it? How, I don't know. I mean, I wish I could do it, but I, I would like to. But the point is, as it says here, that bad really has no real existence. It just, it, it comes from, everything is really good. It comes from its source. And when the good is revealed, so then this bad goes away. Right? The, 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 the purpose of the challenge of the bad was only to reveal the good. Okay. Good, you know, that's that's a sort of an answer. I mean, how do you explain all the people that died in the Holocaust and all this? Okay, I, I have no don't I have no answers to that, and I also have no answers to even the, the this boy how we got better. I don't know, I don't know how the Rebbe does it, but that's the fact. Here's what we're learning. Let's just cancel what we're learning. Bad things in the world are not lacking. There's a lot of suffering in the world, a lot too much <clears throat> and suffering in the world. And everyone agrees there is. I don't know, everybody. I mean, there's people who like the suffering. World War II, whatever, this German guy just loved suffering, just you know, killed millions of people. But most people don't like suffering. It's bad. And the Rebbe is saying that there are things in this world that are called ra. They are bad. They are bad. But the source is good. What does it mean, the source? What keeps it alive is really good. And the fact of the matter is, is when this source is revealed, then it transforms the whole thing, the bad itself, too good. That's what it says. We're reading this world in order to transform bitterness to sweetness. Ra, shehu, ain't no musak. It's just we can't understand it. Shalom, yochal, lered, la'olam, hashafal, because this good can't come down 
into this physical world. <clears throat> this is called Michla de Kik. This is the small, like a uh, thread of life, which really comes from God's. Uh, it comes from godliness, pure godliness. So I think I've told you the story about 15 times already, but I'll tell you again that there was a person uh, that I read that he, he said that he was, he lived in Germany and right before the war and a, a Jew, a Jew. So they caught him anyway, they, 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 they put him into prison and eventually they put him into a concentration camp. And he saw all the terrible things that were in the concentration camp <clears throat> and he lost his family. And, and then he escaped somehow or other near the end of the war, he escaped and he escaped through the woods. It was cold, it was this. And finally he made it to the, to the Russian troops and the Russians, they, handed him over to their interrogators and they decided he was a spy. So they sent him to, to uh, Siberia. In Siberia, he worked the hard labor for who knows how long. And finally, either he escaped there or he got out. Anyway, however it was, he somehow or other managed, you know, he suffered and suffered. Somehow or other he managed to get a, um, uh, on a boat to Israel. So he got on the boat to Israel, on the boat to Israel. So the British caught him and they put him into Cyprus or somebody in one of these concentration camps. The re detention camps, whatever it's called. And finally, however, it was, and they suffered over there, there was hunger, and finally got out. He's telling this whole story of his life. He said, but I want you to know, the end of the story was, he said, but I want you to know that I never had one bad day in my life. He said, I had a lot of days that I did not understand, but I didn't have one day that was bad. And in other words, he believed that, you know, he's alive, and he doesn't understand how he's alive, and he's coming from God. So obviously, and God is good, so somehow or other, this must be somehow good. And he, but he had no idea how. So he said, he didn't have one bad day in my life. But on the other hand, he can't say it was good days. It was, they certainly weren't good. You know, but nobody enjoys. But on the other hand, it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. He just didn't understand it. Right? Obviously, this is going. Vizel Yasreni Yasar Yasreni Yodke. This is what it means that. God punished me. King David, look at King David. Look at the Psalms of King David. Uh, I mean, I never really uh, counted it, but I'm sure that more of the, more than half of the Psalms are talking about Do King David's terrible suffering that he suffered in the world. He had enemies from every corner who wanted to kill him. His whole life, from the very beginning, from the very beginning of King David's life, that everybody hated him. <clears throat> he was cast away by his brothers, cast away. <coughs> his son went against him. his two sons went. Nevertheless, Yasso Yisraeli Yudke, that's what it means. Tortured, tortured me, Yudke, God's name. This is the first two letters of God's name. This is the beginning of God's name. God's name is Yud and then He and then Vav and He. The first two letters are showing a higher level of godliness. This is what makes all the tortures in this world. I, so maybe we say, oh, so maybe tortures are good. Maybe we should pray for tortures. God forbid. We pray exactly the opposite. We pray every day. We religious Jews, 19 prayers every day that there should not be any suffering. That God should bless the years. He should heal the sick people. Mashiach is going to come. There won't be any, any suffering. The ideal is there won't be any suffering. But when there is, so we have to say, listen, God is the boss and he does everything for the good. And the reason we're here is to transform the bad into the good. What has this got to, to do with a copper snake? God willing, we will find out tomorrow. Now let's learn. Let's learn the Sikha of the Rebbe. Here we go.